Okay. Well, we're going to do it. So um, I guess, do you want to play that funky music? It's time to find out why they say you don't want to see the sausage get made. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. And you can't block me in person because I'm literally here and you're stuck with me. So it is brilliant to see everybody at the Victoria Tavern right now. Hello, everybody. Hey. We uh, hopefully have a fabulous show for you today. Or we don't. But we can't change that now. The good news is we know the beginning is going to be great because we're going to be talking to Maraid from the Arsenal Foundation. Uh... And you probably can know, those of you who are in here, that I actually talk at the speed that I talk on the podcast. So that's just how it works. Uh, sorry, there's not much I can do about that. But we'll be talking to Maraid about the Arsenal Foundation and about the way that you generously raised over, Clive, did we get over? Over 25,000 pounds in September for the Arsenal Foundation. That is great. Should also mention, because uh, philanthropy and and Generosity is a big part of the Arsenal community. Uh, Mike from the Gooners Pod is here from the Gooners vs. Cancer charity, and they won Best Charity at the FCA Awards the other night. So kudos to Mike. Um, a really special cause as well. So uh, you will get to meet uh, those of you listening, you've met before, those of you here in person, uh, Tim and Clive and James McNicholas and James Benj in just a few moments. But the, uh, the VIP guest of the day is Maraid from the Arsenal Foundation. Maraid, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Elliot. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Victoria Tavern today um, at this live event. Fantastic. Um, and hello to all your listeners as well. Thank you. Uh, two years ago, we came up with the idea that it would be great to partner with you to raise money. And uh, we did it. And then this year, we really tried to push the goal a bit higher. And I think I undershot because the generosity of the community to raise over 25,000 pounds is really incredible. But I, I think for people to really understand who this helps and, and what this means to people who, whose lives will be dramatically impacted by the Arsenal Foundation would be great. So do you want to talk a little bit about where this money goes and, and who we're helping? Absolutely. I think, uh, first of all, I want to say a massive thank you to all of the listeners and everyone here today. 20, 25,000 pounds, over 25,000 pounds in one month was just fantastic. So a huge thank you to everybody. Um, and you're right, Elliot, I mean, that kind of funding and that money really, really helps the communities where we work. So we do work both locally and internationally. And actually, what's really important is that, you know, we have this huge heritage of helping our communities. You know, Arsenal in the community has been around for over 34 years. And um, we've actually taken a lot of learnings from our work in the communities, all the communi local communities around the stadium. Uh, where we've helped thousands, hundreds of thousands of children and young people and their families and their communities. And we've looked at how can we bring that to other communities, other global communities. And um, we have developed a particular pro program called Coaching for Life, where we take everything we've learned with our local coaches and bring that internationally as well. And we bring that to kids who really don't have any chance. And we're looking at how does the arsenal, how can we leverage the Arsenal name and what we do in our local community and really bring those kids in and give them a sense of belonging and what it means to be part of the Arsenal family. So everything, all of the money that everybody here has raised is really reaching out to those kids and letting them know what it means to be part of the Arsenal family. And the other thing to mention is that it's really, it gives us such a huge sense of pride in what we're doing as Arsenal off the pitch as well. Because I visited, um, we do a lot of work in a refugee camp uh, called Zatari, which is in northern Jordan, and it's for Syrian refugees. This camp is massive. It, there's 90,000 people live there, and most of them thought they were only going to live there for a few weeks. But the Syrian crisis, the anniversaries, it was a 10-year anniversary this year. So many of them have been living there years and years. And so you can imagine there's a lot of kids there who don't have much joy in their lives. 
Um, and so we brought the Coaching for Life programme, we brought our coaches from North London, brought them out to the camp, and actually the football pitches that we've built and maintained out there are the only piece of greenery in this massive desert area, which is, it has nine districts, and there's 40,000 kids there. So when they see the Arsenal, you know, we have the Arsenal um, logos and our name all over the, uh, the areas where kids come, and they have a safe place to play, they can be kids again. But we've also done something quite unique with this um, program. You see, Elliot, I'm a longer talker than you. <laughs> <laughs> Look how long I've gone without interrupting. <laughs> see, I think, that's, uh, I think it's because I'm Irish. You know, I'll keep talking as well. I'm, I'm happy but, to hear. <laughs> but um, we, um, we've also done something really special with this Coaching for Life program because we've built in some sort of programming that also helps the kids' well-being and their mental health as well. And I think that that's really important. So. Of course, you know, building the pitches and that is important, but it's great how unique football is in terms of getting the kids there. And when we get them there, then we do other kind of parts of programming that helps build their self-confidence, their self-esteem and all that kind of stuff. So it's really great for the kids and they absolutely love and adore Arsenal. So it's great, it's great to see it. Didn't, uh, I think Per went down there, right? Mertesacker? Yeah, Per Mertesacker launched the program in 2018, wow. okay. and it was fantastic. I mean, I think it was, um, I mean, it's a very humbling experience when you go to these kind of camps anyway. And I think for, for Per, it was very humbling experience as well. He met some of the kids, uh, lots of those kids who had fled their homes under terrible circumstances. And many of the kids have seen things no kids should ever see. Um, but Pear was fantastic with the kids, talking to them about their hopes and ambitions for the future and really looking forward with, the, with those kids. Um, so I think it had a big impact on, on Pear as well. And as many of you know, you know Pear often t talks about mental health as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. So he was quite impressed with the level of um, kind of different modules and different ways we were teaching, different things we were teaching the kids. Uh, through the program. So yeah, it was great. It was really good. Well, I think it's also just there's a lot of cynicism in football. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money that flows into football in ways that maybe are uh, not as helpful in terms of the global community. And so to see that Arsenal is so committed to using the resources and the power of the club to support more needy communities, obviously that's fantastic. And I just sort of wonder when these kids and, and just the people that the foundation helps generally are touched by the club, I would imagine this forms bonds that last a lifetime and, and builds the Arsenal community, just in terms of supporters and people that love the club, even bigger. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, and I mean, I think it really, it really brings our values out as well as a club, you know, and yeah, how, we, how we help these communities, how we respect them. And I think, you know, the kids know that, you know, if there's a coach there wearing an Arsenal jersey, that they can be a trusted adult that they'll go and hang out with. And they'll often come and they'll, you know, they'll talk about their fears or how they're feeling in school or, you know, any other troubles they may have in their life. And I think that connection as a young kid when you're Arsenal, whether it's in the local communities as well, this has also happened in the local communities. And um, you really trust that name. And it's really great to know that there's such positive feelings about what Arsenal is doing, but what Arsenal stands for and what we stand for as a club. I think that's really important. Well, I, I want to say personally that it means a lot to me that you let us create this program, uh, raise the money through our community uh, to support the Arsenal Foundation, that the work you're doing is brilliant. It was great to talk to Drew when he came on the yeah. podcast. There are a lot of wonderful people. I, I haven't met all of them, but look forward to, to doing another one with you and setting a higher goal next year. Sound good? That's great, that's fantastic. And thank you again to everybody. And I hope at some stage we'll be able to do a podcast maybe with some of the kids and young people who have benefited as well. I think you might like to hear some of their stories directly rather than just hearing them from me. But they, thanks they for everything you're doing. They can host a podcast. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks, Elliot. Let's hear it for the Arsenal Foundation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. The fact that she took the time to drive up here and be a part of this is really special, so thank you so much for doing that. And um, now we can get on with the meaningless, trivial football chat that you are all here to engage in. And the first person I want to introduce, he needs no introduction, but without it, he won't come up to the table. 
You've read what he's written this week. I've written about this this week. Probably not, but you've definitely heard him. On the variety of podcasts he's on, I like to think, most importantly, the Arsenal Women's Podcast on the Arscast, but also the Arsenal Vision Post Podcast. Tim Stillman. You can follow him on Twitter, at Stilberto. Hello, Tim. You have to give us the hello there. Hello there. That's the good stuff. And now, Gabriel, are we ready? Oh my God, it's Clive! And it's Clive. You can follow him on Twitter at Clive PAFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Did anyone else feel the ground shake then? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big man. <laughs> can, n- no way you can hear that, Gabriel, right? I'm not the only one. You see what I do. Now, the question is who is James 1 and who is James 2? All right, fine. You know him as Gunner Blog on Twitter, you know him as a celebrated author, you know him from his work with fine journalistic institution, The Athletic, and the even finer journalistic institution, The Ars Cast Extra. It's James McNicholas. Hi, guys. (laughs) Never been on the podcast before. Had to fly to London and book a pub, and he's like, fine, I'll do it. (laughs) You got A man I was lucky enough to meet in Los Angeles, actually, when uh, Arsenal came to L.A. in a very fun event out there. A man who uh, currently works for CBS Sports, Paramount Plus, all of the uh, great media organizations that cover, it says here, the Champions League. I I don't know. Um, Do they have a men's Champions League? Uh, Yeah, and the women's Champions League. There you go. That's more relevant to our interest, Uh, although the outcomes aren't always what we hope. It's James Bench. <laughs> West Ham have just scored. Oh. Already paying attention. <laughs> but that's not good for us, is it? You know what? We can debate that on the podcast. Okay. So I thought what we could do, as I mentioned earlier, uh, before we actually started recording, is just have a little bit of trivial chat, and then do as much Q&A as possible. So I think one of the interesting places to start, Patrick Vieira makes his return to the Emirates as Crystal Palace manager on Monday, and they are trusting a process of their own, I think it is fair to say. Uh, Palace is a club that I have been critical of (laughs) on this very podcast because they had a lot of older players, a lot of expiring contracts, but they've really been aggressive, I think, in trying to reshape the state of their squad and what they do, moving on from Roy Hodgson, now more possession-oriented, more pressing and younger. So it got me to thinking, like, a lot of clubs are getting sharper about the process and about the way to build teams in this manner. And that just means it's even harder for us to find leverage and uh, plus expected value approaches to building a squad this way. So, uh, Tim, I'll start with you. In terms of the process trusting the process. I think it's sort of a label that has come to be associated with Arteta in a way, and and maybe in a pejorative way. When you look at what's going on in Palace and what we're trying to do, do you think that for the clubs that aren't the cities of the world and the Uniteds of the world, that what we are doing is really the only reasonable way to go about trying to use your resources to compete? Yeah, sure. When you were um, talking about Patrick Vieira, I thought we'd start this on like a cheerful Kind of, <laughs> kind uh, of no. jo- and ha- talk about ha- the Invincibles or Have you something? been on the podcast before? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in short, yes. Um, there, there aren't many stupid clubs left in the Premier League, I'd say. Um, Spurs, maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you look, at, you look at Brentford, right, yesterday. You look at the game they gave Chelsea, for example, and um, the game they gave another London club. I can't remember who it was at their stadium. And, and there, there are very few teams now who just kind of... Um, you know, come up and just throw money at it. And usually there's, like, I think you can't come into the Premier League without, like, a strategy anymore. And to be fair, Palace had a strategy under Roy Hodgson. It was, let's put loads of 30-year-olds in defence, sit them behind the ball and whack it up to Wilfred Zaha. Now, that's a strategy. Bad whether, one. <laughs> whether, whether you like it or not, it's a strategy, and it kept them in the league for a little while. But obviously, they wanted to do something different. They wanted to do something different for quite a while. That's why they hired uh, Ronald De Boer, for example, and then they gave up on it after four games. 
Um, and, and it's fair to say Patrick Vieira could have gone that way for them. He wasn't their first choice, for example. Um, but, and, they, and, and, you know, I guess a little bit like Arsenal, the kind of the, the project has been forced on them a little bit because all of their players' contracts were up, so they lost about 10 players anyway, so they had to do a massive rebuild. So, in fairness, I'm not sure how much of an exemplar Crystal Palace are um, just because of the way things were. Their manager's contract ran out so did all his players, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I mean, in short, yes, it does make it harder for us. Um, perhaps it's slightly scary that we're talking about Crystal Palace like this mm. <laughs> instead of uh, teams that maybe we're looking up at, like um, West Ham, for example. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, like, like 100%, that makes it harder. And that means you have to be sharper and smarter. And one of the things I wonder quite a lot is that period where Arsenal were kind of squeezing into fourth maybe 10 years ago, in this competitive environment, where would that Arsenal be finishing? It's a great, it's a great, yeah. I mean, and I don't think they'd be finishing where they did. No, and, and actually how much better is that team than this one? Mm. Is it just that the bar has gone up a little bit? Um, I mean, I'm asking that rhetorically. I think the bar has gone up and I think that Arsenal team of about a decade ago probably would be finishing about seventh or eighth because of the nature of the competition. But yeah, but yeah 100% Palace, it's kind of been visited upon them, but they're, they're, they've taken a bit of a gamble and it seems to be working. But I think it then begs the question, that's the wrong way to use that phrase, by the way. It raises the question. It, Clive, like, how much can you make, how far can you stretch your resources? Because the interesting thing is you have a club like Palace that theoretically doesn't have the resources of, of a club like Arsenal. But they're going young. They're finding you know, young up-and-coming players. The idea, obviously, we know about sell-on value and age curves and all the things that we like to prattle on about. But how much, how much can you leverage your resources when you're going young? Like, for example, if a Ben White is 50 million pounds, right? If, if an Odegaard is 35 or 40 million pounds, and you look at the young players that Palace have added, who I think are quite good you know, and, and not nearly as expensive, is it possible, I mean, outside of buying the Mbappes and the Hollands of the world, is it possible for us to really gain the kind of advantage we should be able to with our resources trying to build this way? Or are we just going to be sort of m more stuck with other clubs that are using a similar approach? You know I'm not answering that question, didn't you? What, what would you like to talk about today, buddy? What's so, on your mind? So basically, the way I see it is, Everybody's smart, everybody's sharp, everybody has access to sports science, everybody has access to the same data on players. That means everyone's looking to recruit the same people, everyone's looking to recruit the same people to work within the clubs, right? So it's a small world football, right? At that elite level, the good people are well known, much like in all the jobs you have, you go onto LinkedIn and the good people are right there in front of you. Do you know what I mean? So I think we have to realize that the world has now become level, so what's your point of difference? Our point of difference is maybe some of our academy work that we do, uh, some of those young players, for example, and we've taken on a medium to longer term strategy. But what I will say that, every, look at West Ham on the TV today, right? Every one of them can run, right? Every, there's no Neil Ruddocks out there anymore. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's what you've got to think about. Everybody can run. Right? Everybody can run. Everyone can move it. Everybody has pattern play. Everyone goes to the same coaching seminars. It's, it's the same, so what, you've got to get the best people that understand development, understand how, what we spoke about the other day, Tim, injury prevention, understand how to maximise physical potential, technical potential, and mess this all together. And that is a resource. That is a way of working, a way of operating. It's a resource for your club. It's not just cash. Some, some of our most expensive signings haven't always worked out because in our minds, they, we have an expectation upon them that they can't reach. Do you see what I mean? And so the resources is ways of working. I, I say this a lot, right? How you operate, ways of working, what's your point of difference, recognizing who you are and being consistent with it and have a sustainable way of playing. When you have that sustainability that's recognizable to people, like all of you people, when we lose a game, we go, you know what? I know what we're trying to do. Do you see what I mean? When we lose a game, and I don't know what we're trying to do, then uh, that's much when my phone blows up, right? So that's <laughs> a, uh, and that, and it's the same for all of us, right? So I think that's where we're heading. We're looking for sustainability, repeatability, a way of playing, and an identity within the club. And that's why we feel a bit more positive than we have done maybe in the previous, maybe eight months or so. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes sense. I, I think in terms of, 
though people having patience for where you're trying to go with that approach, James mm -hmm. one, um, <laughs> uh, like the, the challenge is Tim referenced the sort of project youth of the past, but we were always top four and maybe just were allowed to be top four by virtue of the competitive landscape more than our own success. But I don't know exactly what the goals should be in the timeline should be of trying to do it this way. I think there are people that will say, well, eighth place is clearly unacceptable. Well, what's acceptable? Well, it's sixth. Or maybe it's just the underlying metrics are good or the attacking football is interesting. So given that the landscape is dramatically changing and certainly could touch on the, the way Newcastle might change that, but what are the right metrics for success and the right timelines? Because it's easy for us to all sit here and just passionately say we're willing to be patient with the process. But when you've dropped points, it's a lot harder to feel that way. So mm. how do we establish... How do we establish what the goals are and the time frame for the, achieving them? It's really difficult. And I think the club internally will have their own timelines for that. And I think they'll be more specific. But I think for us as fans, the question that I think is really interesting is basically, do you feel like it's going to be better tomorrow? And I think as long as you feel like you could be better tomorrow than you were today, then fans generally are prepared to accept that. And I think that was at the core of the, of the kind of post Emirates Stadium move project this idea that you know we are kind of having to save financial resources, we are having to take a route with younger players. But if you think back to that time, and if you were a fan in that time, when we had the likes of Wilshire and Nasri and Van Persie, we knew we weren't title contenders year in, year out, but we did believe collectively in this idea of a future. And ultimately, it's a future that didn't really transpire, but it was sort of an idea that people were prepared to accept because the direction of travel felt positive. To, to be fair, I don't think the little boy inside Robin Van Persie was, was positive. He was a, that, that was a fly in the ointment that none of us saw coming. <laughs> but it, it, it's interesting that, um, especially given there's that picture of him, right, as a little boy in full <laughs> Arsenal kit. Yeah. He, it turns out he had two little boys inside him. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> but, <laughs> what... No worse than my camera's toilet. True, yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. Um, Palace have adopted a, a project that's not that dissimilar to what Arsenal are doing in terms of kind of the profile of players that they're recruiting. Um, they found an intelligent way to buy players from Chelsea. I like it. Um, mm -hmm. Something we could learn. They're going for the younger guys who didn't make the breakthrough. So you look at like Gwehi and they've got... Who's the guy they got on loan? Connor Gallagher, who looks like a really outstanding player. Uh, they've done a lot of smart stuff. They brought in Edouard, who was really impressive in Scotland. But I think, you know, that is the way to do it. I mean, Arsenal, you talk about Newcastle coming in and how that's going to change things. Ultimately, for Arsenal, it doesn't change things that much. They've placed their bets, to, to borrow a line from Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, they have put their money on the table. They're among the gamblers, as he would say. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they have. And they've put big money down on people like White, people like Odegaard, people like Ramsdale. And they're saying, that's our bet. And ultimately, whatever Newcastle come in and do, it's not going to change that dramatically. Arsenal aren't going to be able to spend that kind of money, I don't think, window on window, year on year. Um, and they've put a huge bet as well on the young academy talent. You talk about people like Smith Rowe, Saka. Those guys are wearing number seven and number 10. That isn't coincidence. That's a message. That's telling us this is what we're trying to do. And I think actually maybe more so than at any point, certainly since kind of the final couple of years of Arsene Wenger and certainly since he left, I, my feeling is that fans are kind of on board with that. That as much as this was a very difficult start, people have really rallied around this idea. And trust the process is a bit of an unfortunate phrase. And <laughs> I bet there are people in Arsenal comms who curse the day anyone ever said that. Yeah. Um, I think Mikel Arteta, to be fair to him, I don't know if he actually said it. I think he said we need to respect the process and it's just become a thing that... It was a meme in the NBA, to be sure, fair. It right, started, right. It started there. But the, the team that trusted the process became quite good for what that's worth. Okay, well, we'll bear that in mind. <laughs> um, it's certainly an idea Mesut Ozil's picked up on, which is helpful of him. Oh, thank um, goodness for that. But I, I, I suppose what I've been thinking more recently is kind of like, trust the process sounds quite frustrating because it's a very nebulous idea. No one knows what that is. But I think I can trust the project. Like, I prefer that. I believe in... That's why he writes for a living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I believe Work, that, working. like, I believe in the recruitment that Arsenal are doing. I think for the first time in a while, I think that there's a really strong idea behind it. And obviously each case is different and there are no guarantees, but at least there's a coherent strategy there. And so, and that's not attached necessarily, I think, to any manager. It's about the way the club conduct themselves. And I think it's 
it's really important that they've done that. I think it will become increasingly important with influx of money to people like Newcastle. Arsenal aren't going to be able to compete on those terms. So as Paul would say, they've placed a gamble, they've placed a bet. And we'll wait and see how that plays out. I think the painful part of that bet is that the only way this process or this project works is partly by investing in these younger players and then partly by seizing on opportunities to cash in on them. And James two? <laughs> James, James B. Ben. James B. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think that is going to be the really tricky component of this, is that we, we went through a period of real fearfulness of selling. We had Cesc Fabregas taken from us, right? And Samir Nasri, bullet dodge maybe, and Adebayor, bullet dodge maybe. And, you know, come to think of it, there were a lot of sales that maybe weren't so bad in the light of day. But I think as a club, we developed an identity of not wanting to be a selling club. And ironically, it was the period where we stopped selling that saw us maybe go the wrong direction. And we've covered this at length, but losing Ramsey for nothing and Alexis just for a Mkhitaryan swap and recommitting to Ozo and then losing him for nothing as opposed to cashing in, there could have been as much as 140 or 150 million pounds of resources to use to build the squad. So the question becomes, is the hardest part of trusting the process, not what we're doing now, but going to be the decision making that comes if one of these players has a bid, has an opportunity to leave for monumental money, and, and how do you think the club has to respond in that environment? Because that's, you know, obviously if someone came in for Saka right now at 100 million pounds, none of us would want to sell him. The question is, the process may involve a decision like that in the future. So how do you see that playing out? Well, I mean, if you look at the, the teams that have, without financial support from a, a, a country or mm -hmm. a multi-billionaire that have taken a leap I mean, you would maybe put Dortmund in this, but certainly you would put Liverpool, and it is about selling at the right moment, understanding when your assets aren't going to increase in value. I mean, equally interesting hearing everyone sort of talk about Palace, I think, the, and clubs like that, even West Ham, the one thing we forget is that Arsenal's turnover year on year is at least double any mm -hmm. of those teams. Yep. So you can, what you can do as Arsenal is do project rebuild, project youth, however you want to, term it but still invest significant funds and pick someone that you are a bit more certain is the finished article so palace say mark gay fantastic in the championship but there was no evidence there's no evidence of how he would perform in the premier league whereas arsenal ben white it's a huge investment but you have you have a degree more certainty of what you can get from him in the premier league so i think it's it's, it's tough as an Arsenal fan because your expectations are rightly the highest level. This team, the expectation for them should be that over the coming years, they develop into at the bare minimum a top four team, ideally a title challenger, because this is Arsenal and, and that's what you expect, hard as it may be. But you do have the money to, to kind of jumpstart the project without selling equally. Look, you know, there are players in that squad that that you have that you that you can cash in on and make the most out of by developing them smartly. I think we will have this conversation about maybe a Saliba. Uh, that's you know just uh, uh, that's not reporting or anything. That, you know, but he was on my don't talk about list. Oh god, yeah, with, I can't believe I brought him up so already. You, James. Well, <laughs> James brought up Urzel, so yeah, there you uh, go. <laughs> he's worse. But but in in a way, that's the joy of buying players that are under the age of twenty three. Is even if things don't go quite right, there's asset value there that there wasn't in a Willian, that there wasn't in players that you were buying when the plan was, God, if we just get this one player, we're back in the Champions League. And I do respect Arsenal for at least, at last, taking that long look at the squad and going, it's not one player off anymore. It's half a dozen players off. Yeah, James. Can I just jump in on that? Just Please. to say that I think the question about, you know, what would happen if Bid came in for one of our, our golden young stars is, is a really interesting one. But... There are other ways in which Arsenal can sell intelligently. And another really encouraging aspect of this past summer is that I think they did that in the case of Joe Willock. Um, I mean, and I don't mean in any way to disparage what Joe's done since he's gone to Newcastle. They're not a great team. They're not having a great time of it. There's a lot of uncertainty around the manager. But nevertheless, um, the form that he was showing in that final part of the season, what was it, seven consecutive goals, we all knew, I think everybody knew, that that wasn't sustainable in any realistic Not remotely, sense. No. Mm -hmm. And I think Arsenal made a decision, kind of a stylistic decision really, about this is not the player that we're going to keep here, we're going to take the money. And too often, Arsenal haven't done that. And they're not perfect in that regard. I think there are probably other players within the squad we could all think of that they might have done that with this summer and probably brought more in. But... 
It's not just about how we sell the big, big stars. It's about the decisions that we make on other players within the squad and how early we're prepared to make them. And I think we've seen a little bit of a sign of improvement there, but there's still some way to go. Yeah, that's fair. I think there's, look, there's always going to be questions about what a player can become. It's speculative. But I, I think if you look at selling Alex Wobie, who's a lovely player, but that was a good sale. Selling Joe Willock, a good sale. And I think you can point to other players where we've been less decisive, where an opportunity may have been missed. Whether that was Eddie Enkedia might be an example of that. Um, a player who has no path to playing time right now. And, you know, it's not great for him. You know. Well, it's, it's funny. We're praising Crystal Palace for their intelligent recruitment and taking these Chelsea players, but we should probably also be praising Chelsea. Yeah. You know, they... I mean, I, I'm not going to do it, but no. you do it. Feel free. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're the guys who send these guys out on loan, who get them first-team experience, who enable them to build a profile, build a reputation, and they become multi, multi-million pound assets. Yeah. Um, it's and it, really and smart. You talk about Crystal Palace. I mean, there's an example of a club that their process might be light years ahead of where it is now if they had cashed in at 80 million pounds on a Wilfred Zaha, and they chose not to. And he's a lovely player, don't get me wrong, but he will probably leave them for nothing when this is all said and done. And would, what would they be able to do with that extra money? I have made it through the portion that I consider the awkward work down the table section. So if it's okay with all you guys, I'd like to do question and answer, if that suits everybody. Can um, I just say, usually when other people are talking on the podcast, I'm usually scrolling through Twitter. Can't do that in the live section. And, and I'm really glad because I listened and you guys are really good. And I want to say... That's always been obvious to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm There's just nothing like down. getting a notification from Twitter that Tim has tweeted. <laughs> and I'm like... This week's column, everything James, <laughs> James and Clive just said. Yeah. Easy, saves you having to record. Okay, um, I'm going to grab the microphone. And I get the sense that we'll get a chance to get to most people. Uh, Gabriel, is the mic good? Good to go? Yep, good. Okay, so we'll start with just... Anybody have a question? Surely somebody has a question. Okay. All right. Yes. There we go. Um, I don't know that I can... You know what? You don't need to hear from me. Somebody vamp. Vamp. Here you go. What's vamp? What's vamp? <laughs> uh, so, myself included, are we overhyping Martinelli? Oof. That is, that is a tough one. We... Uh, we it's funny. I don't want to be controversial, but... <laughs> is this going out anywhere? <laughs> I mean... Get him out of here. Okay. Security. Cheers, guys. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, well, so, Tim, I, as our resident Brazilian expert, he didn't play for Brazil in the summer, and I think that there's a, a, the Olympic team, right? He, he, didn't, he scored a penalty. But um, he's a player that I think is, is really a great example of what we lose with not having European football, uh, and not only in James not being able to cover Arsenal on midweek. But do you, do you feel that, the hype is excessive with him, that it's somewhere in the middle, or he's just waiting for his moment to break out? I think he's waiting for his moment to break out. I think the problem Martinelli has both for Arsenal and at international level, so you're right, he didn't play for Brazil in the Olympics, but they actually have some really good young forwards. It's a big country, they all play football. It's, it's kind of hard to break Heard into thing the about Brazil that, yeah. team. Um, but I think the thing is about Martinelli is maybe he's a player a little bit out of time in terms of all of the kind of, I guess, the fashion in football is structured pattern play. He doesn't do that. We know he doesn't do that. And in one sense, that's what makes him brilliant, particularly if you watch Arsenal and you watch Arteta ball quite a lot, like someone who operates outside of the structure and takes shots and takes people on. That's quite thrilling, like he's a fans player, but I'm not sure he's really a coach's player. And that might be a problem for him, but... I mean, personally, I really like him for that. I think you need at least one player like that in your team. The problem is we've probably already got two already in maybe Aubameyang and definitely Pepe. And so that's a blockage for him at club level. Um, we, we've really got to find a way to integrate him, though, because either he will be a brilliant player for Arsenal or, you know, going back to the discussion we were having earlier about selling players, he's a player we could sell for big money. This is a guy, Barcelona wanted him. He trained with Manchester United three times. Juventus were interested in, in him. All of the big clubs in Europe were interested in him when he was 15, 16. And he's one of these players who operates outside of your structure. And if you can tolerate that, he will go big. The question for me is whether Arteta will ever tolerate that. Not necessarily in a player, but while we've got Pepe certainly in Aubameyang. Will he ever get that chance at Arsenal? I'm not 
totally convinced because he will go somewhere else. Like England is not home to him. Spain is just as close to his home as England is. So whether he'll get that chance at Arsenal, I don't know, but I think he will be a big player for somebody and it should be us. So you're saying there's a chance that Barcelona will give us the five quid they have left yeah. to buy Martin Allen. That, that'd be great. Can I just uh, say something Yeah, Clive, that? I wanted to ask. Yeah, go ahead. I think, Fire away, um, whatever you want to say. When, when you have a player like Martinelli, if I asked everybody in the room, what do you think his best position is? I'm not sure we'd all agree. And I think that's part of the issue. A player must be defined and he must define himself. Right, so if you're a coach, I need to know exactly how I'm going to use this guy. And if he's in between, which he is at the moment, he's not quite a, a lone centre forward. He's not a player that plays in behind. He can play wide both sides. I personally think he's best off the left. But would some people drop Smith Rowe for him? Probably not. Would some people like to see Pepe there or Saka there? Probably yes. So your, your question is a really good one. But then I, I challenge us, you know, when I see all the first 11s out there, I don't see him in it, right? Can I ask you a question, so, though, about, about this? Mm -hmm. So take the Brighton game, right, where Arteta said we needed to be braver. And one of the things we talked about, and we looked at it when we did a rewatch, was how we got compressed into our own defensive third too much. And Martinelli is a guy that we know is going to run, he's going to push up, he's going to try to get in behind. I think there was a goal he scored against Chelsea, you might remember, um, where he, he did run the length of the pitch to score a brilliant goal. But like, is he a player that in games like that can help us keep the accordion expanded, so to speak, and not let himself get sucked into our defensive third as much? Yeah, we, we spoke about it the other day, didn't we, yeah. about um, having players that pin players back, right? So I... I want to explain this. When you pin a team back, you must have players with the threat to take them the other way. What we did by playing Smith throw out wide left, he rolls inside. Saka rolls inside. When they roll inside, the back three of Brighton were saying, yeah, I'm all right with that. I don't really want to run backwards. I'm all right rolling inside. I can come and smash you from the back and see what, and the plays can press and we can overload into wide areas and keep you where you want to go. So for me, having players that pin people is really important. So I know it's hindsight, right? That Brighton game is a tactical, brilliant game to watch. Hindsight, two speedsters out wide on the touchline, pinning, forcing their back free to think, crikey, do I leave myself with those two? Or do I have to pull my wings back, wing back back? Once you do that, superiorities are over, right? They're pulled back in, and now we can progress the game. We send them back a couple of times over the top, stretch the game out, suddenly Odegaard comes in. Tactics is an evolving thing in the game. Now, none of us would, have picked, would not have picked Smith Rowe for that game after the Spurs game. None of us. We'd have all gone the first same 11, bang. We got presented a different problem. We have a back three issue for me when we play back three teams, but we'll... We'll talk about that throughout the season. Um, but for me, pinning people is key when you play those systems. Pin them back, hold them with the threat, play through, upset through, pin them backwards, and then create the space from which to play. And we just got done tackling on the day, but we didn't lose the game, right? So Martelli in hindsight would be nice. Pepe would have been nice. You know, Lacazette would have been nice. You know, so it's just one of those days, right? Well, I, I, the Leeds Cup tie is a team that presses, that closes down space, compresses you into your half, and I imagine he'll start that game, and so we'll get a really good chance to sort of see in practice, I think, whether what sounds right in theory will work. Um, but to Clive's point, seeing Smith Rowe run into space behind Spurs to you know, score goals and create goals, why would you have made any change? So that's a great question. I forgot what podcast I was hosting. We'll probably get to two questions today, may maybe three. <laughs> so, you want to just pass the mic next door? <laughs> um quite a left field one actually about the sort of the future of the game uh there's a lot of money in football now astronomical amounts um the w women's game is, is 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 much much bigger which is really positive you're also seeing the way we consume uh football um globally is as as changing quite radically as well i guess I, i'm interested in um knowing your opinions of how do you think football might change in the next 10 maybe 20 years that you think we think at the moment could be quite radical quite extreme but actually maybe you've got an idea of that might be true. In, in, in 10, 20 years, the football will, will look, look like that. Have you, you guys got any, as I said, score left field, got any uh, theories about, mm. you know, in 20 years, it's going to be a bit like that? I think we can definitely solve that one pretty quickly. So I'll <laughs> take that on. Uh, James Bench, you, you obviously have the answer. Yeah, well, I've, I have absolutely no. I think the, the reality is the answers that you hear are not the answers that you want, and that's been clear from the Super League, from Newcastle. I think, I, I think there are two forces that, that we'll, we will see sooner or later. 
uh, we will see a salary cap, I'm certain of it, at some stage. But inevitably, that will lead to a long, hard debate at Premier League level. And we're seeing it, in a way, in the Champions League about the idea of relegation and whether it exists anymore. And that, you know, that is anathema to the English supporter. But if you look at the people that were pushing the Super League, it is absolutely not anathema to them, to the Cronkies, to the owners of Liverpool. Um, if they, you know... So interesting thing here, Newcastle sold for around half the value that you would place on an MLS team. That I mean, that those values are ludicrously inflated and not really representative. But the simple fact that the, the owners of an MLS team are guaranteed the same revenue year in, year out, or increasing is a hugely attractive pro prospect. And I think there will be a push. I don't know if it'll be successful, but I do think there'll be a push in the coming years to, to almost turn the Premier League into a, a closed system, or at the very least to cap relegation at maybe one, maybe two teams. I think mm. that is the thing that owners really want. They want guaranteed revenue. And I think bring that in, you might almost see things like a salary cap that would actually be quite good for football, would be quite good for the Premier League, would rebalance things. So, yeah, sadly, I think that relegation is going to be on the table sooner rather than later. James? I, I agree with that. I think that either the Super League will rear its head again um, or the Premier League will evolve to become something more akin to the proposed Super League, and that will probably involve diminishing the risk of, re of relegation. Um, I also think that the game will become more international. I think it's inevitable that games will be played abroad. I think it will probably start with something like a Premier League Cup that happens in the summer, and that will be held in one nation or something like that. But I think it, it's a matter of time until fixtures that are competitive or at least marketed as competitive are happening in other countries. Um, but yeah, I think the Super League one is the really fascinating one. We're still really quite soon after the sort of earthquake that sent through football. And if you speak to people in the game, you hear very split opinions. Some people do say the ferocity of the movement against it was so strong that it will prohibit it from coming back to the table, at least for quite a long time. Others say it's just an absolute inevitability and it's a question of timing. And I, I, would, I would tend to put myself more into the, the latter camp there. Yeah, I, I think you could argue that the Premier League is becoming one anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, since we last won a title, which was years ago, um, there's been five titles for United, five for City, five for Chelsea. One for Liverpool, one for Leicester. That's it, right? So, I mean, 15 of the 17 to the richest clubs. Yeah, James? No, I was just going to say, I think you're right, but the, the money that's flooding in is changing. As Tim said, this league is so much more competitive than the one that we faced 20 years ago. And you can see an example of that. I mean, when, when Abramovich came into Chelsea, I think they won a league title within a couple of years. Um, admittedly, they were kind of in Champions League contention around that time anyway. I think they were in the mix. But... Um, Man City, it took them slightly longer. Um, but then you look at a club like Everton, say, and Sky pointed this out in their coverage today. You know, Mashiri came in, they've spent a vast amount of money on that club, and they're still sitting in that kind of eighth to tenth bracket. And granted, some of that's down to poor decision making. But I think it shows that the amount of money that's required to compete is just rising all the time. And, and Newcastle will be a really interesting test case in that. How quickly can you do this? Yeah, I, I mean, there's nothing that's more reliable predictor. Oh, thank you, kind sir. <laughs> as Mike from the Gunners Pod doubles as beer delivery service. That one is for James. Can you do this for all our podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hugely appreciated. Um, the only thing I would say, you want to know what I think the, the soonest repercussions will be? I think you'll see places for the Champions League and the Europa League change immediately. I think... Within the next couple of seasons at the most, you'll see six Premier League clubs in the Champions League, and then seventh and eighth will be Europa League, or even seventh, eighth, and ninth. The idea that the Premier League is going to have this much money flowing into it, and clubs like Arsenal, for example, are just perennially not in the Champions League, despite having to outspend clubs in Europe that are just basically gifted a place. And again, I realize that that is sort of a very... England-centric view, but it's actually a money-centric view more than anything, and money does tend to talk, especially where UEFA is concerned. They know that the threat of the Super League is out there. They have to placate those clubs in some way, and I think the way is going to be spots in Champions League for clubs beyond the top four in the near future. Clive, it seems like you have something to say. Yeah, I was, I was surprised no one's... Well, I think the way we consume football will change drastically. 
I, I, I think clubs will own their media rights. I think our phones will take care of stuff. The way the youngsters are viewing football today with highlights and snips and clips, I think the way we consume football, I mean, not everyone does three rewatches a week like we do. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, I just uh, see the highlights on TikTok. <laughs> that's all I need. <laughs> and, and I think once clubs get hold of their media rights, that's going to change everything. The, the access internally, what we see, what we're exposed to. I mean, Tim was at the club this week and what he saw from the inside. I mean, this is going to go on and on because we're going to demand it. I mean, you know, Edit, from American sports, the access they have in America is completely different. It's on a different level. So I, I think that's going to be the next phase for me. Once, obviously, with your own media coverage and you have that in your pocket, rather than getting £3 million for a home game at the Emirates, if you've got a little Netflix app and you've got 30 million fans around the world and they've got to pay a pound for a game, guess what? Do the maths, right? It's, it's going to change. It's gonna ch how we consume football is gonna change, and technology will drive that change. I mean, I don't know about you, but I work in the city, and I've been 30 years going up to Canary Wharf, etc. I'm not being in office for 18 months. I never thought that would happen, right? So it's, we are becoming far more virtual, and this is what's gonna happen going forward. So yeah, I, I think that's right, and I. I look forward to the day Arsenal, um, I mean, obviously I hope Arteta has a very long reign, but when he's done, we get Deep Blue, powered by IBM Watson and Artificial Intelligence, to do our coaching and we can move on. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right about the way we consume it. And it's sort of sad because the one thing that I hear from everyone, and Clive uh, was talking about this a lot on the, at the awards event on Thursday, is just the positivity in the ground right now. The way it feels different at the Emirates, and I can't wait to experience that on Monday, and even more special with Vieira coming back, but like what the pandemic has done is made people appreciate the sort of more quotidian or you know ordinary, everyday pleasures of just being together, singing the songs, having a good day out, and really improved the experience. And so it stinks to have to talk about these sort of more cynical aspects of football, because I think a lot of people are recapturing some of the more romantic aspects of football this season, being allowed to go back to the place that they were before. And Tim, I would imagine for you, um, and obviously the women's game has become a bigger part of that for you, but just seeing the atmosphere and the, and the way people feel about going to the game, we were talking about this even before the podcast, just you don't realize how much you miss something when you're missing it, but when it comes back, then it really hits you. Yeah, 100%. That, that Brentford game for me, like I, I say I didn't care that we'd lost, but I still came away feeling really nice about it just because it was the first time I'd seen people in like 18 months and I missed my last train, had to get a cab all the way home. So it cost me roughly the same price that Manchester United away would have cost, for example, <laughs> getting an Uber at two o'clock in the morning. But um, yeah, like I, I really do feel like the state, I, I'm interested to see how long that lasts in the stadium actually, um, because yeah, obviously, all this is, is, is a bit temporal. Well, the 10-0 tomorrow is not going to hurt. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, that is a good point, right? It's all good feeling until the results go sideways for a little bit. Uh, any other questions or shall we... Okay, uh, uh, and, and there... You, Tom. Tom. Can you, or, or, yeah, Tom, you can go up next. Uh, yeah, after you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to wedge in a, a question about my favorite player, Ainsley Maitland-Niles. Does he have a place at Arsenal... I thought he was fantastic in the cup run at left wing back. We've got African Cup of Nations coming up. Thomas Partey won't be around. If he stays at Arsenal, what is his best role? Where should he be? I'll let Clive handle that because I know he wants to, but I will just say this. It's important to raise your hand and say when you're wrong about stuff. I really did not think he had the right traits for central midfield. And I, I would still suggest that from a passing standpoint, there are question marks. But we've seen something this season that I think he adds in midfield that gives us a way to change our patterns of play, the dynamic of what we want to do. And especially when you see someone like Sambi Lakanga dropping into sort of left center back role to cover the space Tierney vacates. And you think about Maitland-Niles' ability to do that and then carry the ball forward and stride out the athleticism that he adds to that role. I, I have to hold my hand up and say, maybe I was too quick to write off the the possibility that he could be a factor for us in midfield. So, Clive, uh, you can just sort of beat me up for being wrong, or you can add something to that comment. No, I'm not going to beat you. I've just okay, met you. Cool. Right? So, um, I think... It's just football, mate. Um, it's just football. Yeah, it, it all comes back to player analysis and, and the types of players that you like, right? So, you know, I'll be straight up. When Seth Fabregas first came to the club, I thought he was all right. I didn't think he... <laughs> I thought he looks a bit slow. He ain't Vieira, is he? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, 
And, and that's what happens. Your eyes go to certain players naturally. And, and you shouldn't be uh, ashamed of that. When I, I, I like Ainsley. I think he's got... I think he's wonderfully athletic and technical at the same time. And for me, when you can play in small spaces and big spaces, go both ways as fast as anybody, win the ball, use the ball, pass the ball, they may not be perfect, but if you can do all those things, you've got a chance, right? You've got a chance. And so for me, a lot of the factors with him were soft factors. I know Elliot loves soft factors, My right? Favorite. So, but but it, does he care? Yeah. <laughs> How's his culture? But it, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it comes back to people around him, maturity, how he responded in certain situations, how he reacted to fan criticism in interviews that was misread about where he wanted to play. And we latch on to these bits of information. We say, oh, the club doesn't talk to us, no one talks to us. As soon as they talk to us, we go, well, he said this. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think sometimes you got, we have to be mature about how we absorb messages about somebody. He said he wasn't a defender. The reason why he said that was he got critiqued for playing left back. You know, and he's not a left back in a four. He might be a left wing back, you know. So, and because of his ability, and his, and his versatility, he was moved around and I felt he wasn't given opportunity in his primary positions often enough because of his versatility covered holes for us. And he got frustrated with that. So for me, and I agree with Arteta on this one actually, he needs to embrace his versatility and say, I'm unique, I bring something different, I need to build myself, I'm selling something new, I'm selling something not many people have. And that versatility is his trick, rather than something that should be a burden on his shoulders. So if I'm his agent, that's what I'm telling him. Come on, mate, you can do something they can't do. You'll be in every match day squad, and when you get your chance, whatever position, take it. And that's what should happen. Right? Shields yeah. Garondi won two league titles and two FA Cups at yeah. Arsenal. Yeah. There you go. James? I actually um, wrote about this week. That's uh, Tim's line. Week. I just, I've always wanted to Cease say Cease and that. desist. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. No, I, I, I did. Um, and it's really interesting because Maitland Niles, I think, has been involved in five of Arsenal's seven Premier League games. I think he's been involved in every game since transfer deadline day when there was that kind of situation where he may have been going to Everton on loan, ultimately didn't. And I think if you told someone then he'll be involved in every league game after that point, they probably wouldn't have believed you. I, I saw that as a positive. I was talking to some people who, who know the situation quite well, and they said, well, look at his minutes. How long is he playing in these games? In a lot of these cases, he's getting on for two minutes. He's getting on in stoppage time. And if you actually break it down in terms of like minutes per Arsenal fixture, he's actually behind on where he was this time a year ago. So I think he's at a really interesting crossroads because he went to West Brom because he wanted to play central midfield. Everybody accepts that. What I was told that I found really interesting is that the way it was described to me He's got that out of his system. And I think somebody somewhere has sat him down and said, listen, you got yourself in the England squad playing as a wing back. Maybe your best performances for Arsenal have come, with the exception of a very good performance at Old Trafford, as a right back or as a wing back on the left or right. And I think he's looking at thinking, for my career, maybe that's where I need to be to fulfil my potential. And there's this sort of ironic situation now where he's involved at Arsenal, but in this utility role. And, and I don't know, I'm not sure if that's going to satisfy him. I don't know if that's going to make him an England player. And I think that he's got that in his locker, especially as a fullback or wingback. So I think he's got a big, big decision coming up. Um, and it's definitely going to be one to watch. I mean, we're approaching, what, 18 months left on the contract, something like that. This, what, do you, what do you think of one, it? One thing I'd, one you, thing I'd just, yeah, mm -hmm. just briefly add on that is, I think we obviously always talk about this from a football perspective, but I think it's worth remembering we've all had that job where you, there's something not quite right in the job and it, it pops up for a while and then you're doing it right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you have a conversation with your manager or your whoever and it gets better for a while, but then the next time it comes back and it's worse. And we're seeing that with Maitland Niles. You know, at the start of the summer, there was a, an interview where he expressed his unhappiness. That then was followed by an Instagram post. And I think. It just, it, it, it will keep coming up for the reasons that James explained, that he's not a regular and he's going to be a player that wants to play regular first team football. And I just think there's too much water under the bridge there. I think it, it's probably best for all parties that it just get a, a fresh start. There's, 
there's a history there and it's uncomfortable, it's awkward. Well, there's an asymmetry too. Like, let's be clear. What's best for a player and what's best for a club sometimes aren't the same thing. And it may be best for Arsenal to have utility player Ainsley Maitland-Niles in our squad on a reasonable wage. Uh, and but that's that what may happened. not be best for him, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the best thing for Ainsley was for him to go to Everton. That's why he took to Instagram. He yeah. knew he'd play there every week. He knew he had a chance at, you know, really furthering his career. Arsenal were in an awkward position where... Not only did they not have Thomas Partey at that point, he wasn't back fit, but they're looking ahead to January. They're going to be without Thomas Partey and Mohamed, Mohamed El Neni in the middle of the park. So keeping a player around who's on a reasonable salary, should we mm -hmm. say, academy guy who's come through, mm -hmm. makes a degree of sense. Um, so I think he'll be here till the end of the season, but I don't see him signing a new contract. And unfortunately, I don't see him staying beyond that. And again, it would beg the question, that's the wrong way to use that, Elliot. It would raise the question. I'm trying to be pedantic here, uh, of what, what would benefit the club and the player. And there, I, just, I think the asymmetry there means that there's, there isn't a long-term future for him to stay. Um, I think, did, did you have a question right there? We, yeah, we've got one teed up, and then we'll go to the back. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, talked, of course, a lot about uh, how clubs in the Premier League have more and more resources. And I guess all of us have to maybe take a step back to what expect uh, in terms of success, in terms of trophies for the last decades. Uh, now, if I look, uh, I'm from Holland, and if I look at a club like uh, Feyenoord, they maybe win, a, win the, the league like uh, every 15 years, but still, they are still the second best team in the league regarding fan base because they built the club around fan culture so, so good, so well. Um, are there things Arsenal can do, maybe apart from squad building and being smart in the market, uh, r regarding fan culture, uh, that is still possible for us to do? Because it, I guess that becomes more and more important in coming it's a, years. It's a great question. I want to just make one point about it, because I, th I thought about something similar, which is just, this is the problem where scale becomes a challenge, right? Which is like, if you have, let's say, a local MLS team in the town where I live, the scale you're trying to reach is achievable through a variety of, of avenues that you can access through social media, you know, digital content, um, live events, things like that. Arsenal has you know, tens of millions of supporters all over the world, and you're starting to talk about diminishing returns in terms of what you can gain from incremental expenditures or incremental programs to, to enlarge the fan base or get more connected to the fan base. So then the question becomes, what is the goal? Is it to bond more strongly with the local community? Is it to expand your reach to a digital audience? I think there's a tension between those two things. We've certainly seen, and there have been comments that have been made that trigger some of those emotions. So I think it is a great question, but I guess, Tim, I will turn it over to you as our resident knowing about the relationship with the club person, and all of you do, I'm just kidding. Um, but like, do you, do you see that tension between the club trying to strengthen the bonds within the local community, but also recognize that part of being able to compete is about growing a, growing a global brand, and those two things can be at odds with one another. They can be, but I think it's becoming that way less and less just because everyone's becoming more cognizant of that relationship. I think back to the 2014 FA Cup final and, um, and actually how well Arsenal kind of you I didn't want to use the word use there, um, but how, how well Arsenal connected with like fan, like supporters clubs around the world during the 2014 FA Cup final. I think we all saw those brilliant videos they put together of like the San Diego supporters club and Mumbai and all of that and put like a lovely video together of everyone experiencing this like uh, the end of the trophy drought together. I think that tension is becoming less and less just because everyone kind of understands. That well, also, isn't, the, it, isn't it accelerated by two years of no one can be physically there anyway. Exactly, exactly. So I, I spent, you know, a year experiencing games in my living room on WhatsApp moaning with all of with all of my friends instead of um, being blind drunk and not remembering games. You can which, do both. Yeah, yeah, which to be fair, <laughs> last season that would have been a brilliant way to do it, to be fair. Um, but I, I, I do think it's becoming less and less. I'll say like in terms of the in-ground experience now, I think what you were saying earlier about the pandemic is, is very well said. But the other thing Arsenal have done this year is they've kind of, um, they're phasing out the away scheme, which, which I'm on um, at the moment. So, and, and because um, people haven't been able to go to away games for 18 months, 
the, the level of credits needed to go to away games has come down. And I think that's really, really contributed to a much better atmosphere. Because what you were getting at away games was like people like me who are there all the time and it's, you know, take it for granted and sit there and like don't sing and just go, come on, entertain me. You always felt that about me. you. <laughs> Never like that. But now like people that like tickets are much more accessible for away games. And actually that's going to increase more and more because there's a bit of a, there's a period where if you're on the away scheme, you can buy tickets first and that's for two years. So actually like quite a lot of people like me are, are going to be either like phased out if you don't go all the time. But I just think tickets are becoming more accessible. So on that kind of fan culture and and look at away games like fan culture is at its absolute height. I think that's that has been much better. It's going to be much better because to be honest, just before the pandemic, it started to become a little bit just the same two or three thousand people every time and that can create that can create cliques and that can create tensions as well so like refreshing that a little bit has been something i think the club has done really well i think i speak for everyone when i say the most important thing they could do would be to connect more closely with podcasts though that would be <laughs> definitely <laughs> it's a joke I mean, it's not a joke but it's a joke um is it cool if we keep it keep it moving turn uh we had some in the back uh can we get the microphones to the, oh we got the microphone in the back it's a magic microphone um, we've had quite a big problem with creativity. We don't score from the midfield enough, which we all can agree with. When it comes to actual striking options moving forward, was, and I love the guy by the way, but Aubameyang, was that a bad thing to actually, in hindsight, <laughs> I heard that, um, uh, he's um, renewing his contract and also moving forward, what is the style of striker that we should be aiming for we had a really interesting conversation just recently about target men strikers coming back into the game, and I thought it was interesting, and, and Clive was talking about that. I, uh, I obviously have never opined about whether the Aubameyang contract was a smart or not smart decision, and I won't reference any opinion I had on the matter. But, um, well, Clive, let me say to you, I mean, you know, we, we sort of have, we're between two stools in a way because we have Lacazette. I think there is an overstatement of the extent to which he is this Firmino role, right? Firmino role, that's the thing we always hear. But that is a very elite level of doing that specific thing. And then Aubameyang is portrayed as just a guy who runs in behind and can't do anything else, but look at the goal he helps facilitate in the Spurs game. So I think both players can actually do more than we give them credit for, but maybe are not as elite at the other thing. So presuming that Balogun doesn't just go on to be the greatest striker in the history of the world immediately, do you have a sense of where we need to go directionally in terms of what our striker's traits should be? Yeah. Let actually, me not say, do you have an opinion? What is your opinion? Uh, I have an opinion. I do think um, the game is, is, is changing significantly. So positionals, positions are changing and positional requirements are changing, right? So not just strikers. So... The reason why we did spend £50 million on, on Ben White is he can play like a midfielder when he has the ball, right? So so people are now sitting in mid-blocks and they're stopping balls going to our centre mids. We can cause damage and go to the next line. So I'll tell you what, we'll let the centre-halves have it because they're crap. Well, actually, our centre-half can play. So now what are you going to do? You could press him and he pops it through the lines. So I think players are becoming more rounded. And it's the same for strikers, right? So I was doing some research the other day on... Um, a guy at Sevilla, Yusef El Nesri, I don't know if you know him, I think um, I was looking at him. I was looking at the goals he was scoring. So he was, he was scoring goals down the sides, straight through, running behind, left foot finish. He was scoring goals running in behind on the right side, chop, left foot finish. He was scoring goals from crosses on the left, scoring goals from crosses on the right. He was setting the play, holding the ball up. Six foot two, jumps out of his boots. I thought, you know what, if I'm scouting him, in a, in a situation where we need a forward that can do lots of things for lots of days to solve problems on that day, I'm thinking, you look quite good. You see what I mean? And so I think the way, again, we talked the other day about rule changes. Now, what happens now at the back? Uh, people can come into the box, so people are dropping deep into the box. Teams are coming onto them. When they come onto them, can you go over the press? So you have three options with the press. You go through, you go around, you go over. Uh, so, you can also just give it away sloppily. Yeah, you can do that. All right, so, and so t some teams are going longer, going over. You go over, you can stick people there, you can hold. You can develop your play from there, set, go through. So I think the game is changing. So having people that can solve, you hear me say this all the time, don't you? Problem solvers, 
people that can solve problems on that day is what you should have. Now, the problem we saw, the Brighton game was so instructive for me. The problem we saw was we didn't hold the ball on first phase. It didn't stick with Aubameyang. We didn't get the ability to come travel up the pitch. We didn't play through enough. And so we didn't solve the problems that day. It doesn't mean that Aubameyang should get in the bin. It just means we have to be more accurate. We have to get people into space to play through a little bit more. So I do think somebody rounded is where we're going. I also think, by the way, Balogun's better off the left at this age. And I think that will become, that'll become true pretty quickly. I think he's very creative and very good off the left. I don't think physically he should be playing down the middle on his own, but you'll see in a few weeks, maybe, if I'm right or wrong, so you can tell me. Mm. Right? So I think <laughs> rounded players that can solve problems is where we should be heading. Yeah, and, and I think what data is teaching us is a little bit of different stuff about the types of players that can play striker, what the role is. We see it, you know, City doesn't really have one, right? So maybe we start to think of Martinelli as that guy or Nicola Pepe as that guy. I think there are people in the team. I mean, Mikel Arteta, quite famously or infamously, played Emil Smith-Rowe as a false nine. Now, it didn't work, but the fact of the matter is the way that position plays can provide a number of different a number of different aspects to how you attack. So I think if we expand our perspective on what a striker can be, there may be players already in, in the team that can provide a solution to that. James? Wish, yeah. Um, so I should have said, see? I made a joke the whole time. This I'll time have a go. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Elliot. This is about, I think the striker, more than any other position, has to... It's only going to work if he reflects your style of play and fits into it. It's not like, Agreed. you know, you buy your midfielders to define your style of play. Now, if Arsenal are what we think they are, which is possession heavy, they'll take their time getting the ball up the pitch, then a striker like Aubameyang is always going to be an uncomfortable fit. I trust him as a finisher. I mean, how much the XG <laughs> reflects that is debatable. But, you know, I think therefore you kind of look at where does City, for instance, a team that probably play the best version of the football Arsenal aspire to, they, you know, we, we've seen a lot of Ferran Torres, but actually I think they've been most successful playing De Bruyne as almost, it's not quite a false nine. It's a playmaker. Mm. It's a guy that that will will pull the defence forward and, and 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 make those final passes. And that's his job. And he'll shoot it from outside the box. But really, his 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 responsibility doesn't exist in the box. That's kind of where I look at Arsenal eventually developing. Which is why someone like Smith Rowe actually may well be worth looking at in the future in a League Cup game as that role. I just don't see. And Aubameyang being the perfect fit. It's really hard to know who is the false nine that would be ideal for Arsenal because so few teams play that way. But if that's the way Arsenal are going, then that's what you have to recruit for. The challenge then is kind of, if Mikel Arteta goes, do you then have to blow it all up over again? But, you know, you've got a squad there that suit a possession game. So stick to that plan, buy a good false nine. And It depends where you want to play your football. And I think this is the thing that has to change for Arsenal is where we play our football. I just, me, just me, I'd just like to see us play it higher up the pitch and, and move the whole thing up the pitch, recover the ball higher up the pitch, have more possession up the pitch. You know, if you watch the Liverpool and City games this weekend, the amount of possession that they have in the attacking third and the amount of ball recoveries they make in that part of the pitch, you need fewer passes, you make fewer demands of your midfield. You know, we criticize Granit Xhaka. Oh, you know, he doesn't have assists, he doesn't do that, but like... He's playing passes from inside his own half. Look at where the midfielders are for Liverpool and City. They're in the attacking third. They're on the edge of the box. And I think if we can compress the space into that part of the pitch, suddenly players like Pepe or Sacco or Martinelli or Smith-Rowe or even Aubameyang, they can all, I think, give us a different, a, a different caliber of performance in, in attack. So that's just my... My two cents. <laughs> Clive, do you have to come back on or can we keep no. the mic on? <laughs> or, no, fine, fine, fine. Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a quality, it's a quality issue. You have a valued right? opinion on it's, this. It's, it's all about quality. Your quality of player. When you're, when you're a footballer and someone gets the ball, first touch is like silk, turns around, chop, chop, chop. You think, you know what, they're quite good. I'm stepping back. Suddenly, it's a, they, have a, they have the ball, right? And it's about quality. Up in our quality levels, up in our patterns. That's where we need to go. As soon as teams feel that, and they feel they don't, that we can't fight ours all day, they're too good, they'll step away and we'll be playing exactly where you want us to play. Do you know what I mean? We'll be playing in those areas. We have to develop those patterns and quality. This is why the money's been spent at the back door, because those players can look after the football, 
they can pass the football and our build-up will improve. And eventually teams will step away because we're not dumb on the ball. And I think that's really important. And when Spurs was a good example of a team that thought our arse of the week, we'll just overload the front door and see what happens. We win the ball, first ball, second ball, turn around, run through the midfield. It wasn't there because they overloaded too, too early. That was a lesson. So other teams, Brighton, really forced us into our area. And we weren't able to answer that problem. So this is an evolving situation. But when it comes down to it, quality of player and can absolutely stay with your philosophy. Don't give up. Don't turn away from it. And City, Liverpool, the way City pushed Liverpool back was genius. And that was down to their quality. Yeah, and, and Klopp talked a lot about it, too, and the way it influenced them psychologically. And Liverpool stopped playing their football and started playing aimless long balls. And I, we talked about this a lot on the pod, but what we did against Brighton reminded me a lot of what Liverpool did in the first half against City in the way they responded to that. So, yeah, that, that's um, all very interesting. But I'm getting the 10-minute warning signal. Is that it, Gabriel? Is that what I'm at? So, and I know it's a little bit warm in here, so I appreciate everybody staying nominally awake for this. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh uh, yeah. Um, I think we have a run of winnable games coming up. Ooh. I hope so. Okay. I also think that <laughs> <laughs> tempting fate. I also Liverpool think games. that we're better with a double double pivot, and I also think that Shaka is one of our most important players. His errors are over-indexed, and I think that he's underappreciated. I don't think Sambi is good enough to play mm. midfield for mm. those four games. It took a while to get spicy, Odegaard, but it's getting spicy now. <laughs> I don't think that Odegaard <laughs> dropping in, even though he's very technically secure, I just don't think that he can replace what Shaka does in the team. So I'm basically asking, how are we going to solve the Shaka missing issue for the next oh four games God. if we're going to win those games? It's a big one. Oh, boy. Where do we go with this? So thank you for the question. Um, a couple of things before I send that. I'm going to pass the mic. I just want to say a, a, f a few things about this. First of all, like the good news is that because Shaka is not available, that's not good news, but when, because he's not available, we're going to have to solve that problem absent being able to say, oh, he should have played. Like, you know what I mean? The debate's been taken out of our hands by injury. So we get to see a little about what our identity can be absent him. And Sammy Lukonga is 21 years old, and he's just come into the league. So I think it is fair to say we're talking about a player whose best qualities are still to come and still to be discovered. The thing that made, I think Shaka had a brilliant season last season, certainly by the standards we've seen from him. I think it was his best season for the club. Because I think he was given a role that he likes, I think the deeper he is on the pitch and the more he can see the game ahead of him, the better he is. He has fewer things going on behind that he has to chase back for. He can ping those long balls up the wing. He can do the things he excels at. The question is, do we want our double pivot dropping into left center back, dropping into the left half space? We saw Samby do it against Brighton, and it allowed Brighton to compress the space in front of us. So I think that is going to be a tension, especially if teams want to press us and push us back. I... Sorry, uh, just to clarify, yeah. I mean, Sambi's not good enough yet. Not, okay, he's okay, never fair enough. Good. You saved yourself there. Cancel um, the security yeah, escort okay, that we had to get the night, right? So, so James Gunnerblog, yeah. uh, I'll start with you. I mean, I guess we, Clive hates it when I call it the 4-3-3. What I mean by 4-3-3 is just that it's party, Odegaard, and Smith Rowe. I don't mean it, it is expressed mm -hmm. on the pitches of 4-3-3 versus the double pivot of Sambi and party with one of those tens in front. But the question becomes, in the absence of Shaka, and you can certainly weigh in on his importance, and I think we all understand he's important, how much can be disagreed upon, do you, do you think that removing the sort of more traditional double pivot forces us up the pitch a bit more, forces us to be more proactive. What, what do you see as the solution over these next few winnable games, his words, not mine, um, w without Granit Xhaka available? Uh, well, Xhaka's clearly a really important player, and I, and I do think that his errors probably are slightly over-indexed because I think among the fan base there is an understandable degree of kind of Granit Xhaka fatigue. Um, and I think that happens with players, you know, especially players who have had some high profile errors in the past. It, it's a really interesting one. The Burnley game, I think, was a really fascinating match. And what Arsenal did there um, really intrigues me. And you, it's a goal for Newcastle. <laughs> goal for Newcastle. Tottenham get battered everywhere they go. Realize in a couple of seasons, we're not going to be happy about that yeah. scoreline. <laughs> For now, it's fine by me. <laughs> Enjoy it while you can. Everywhere they go. Um, yeah, I think what Arsenal did with, in terms of the shape was really fascinating. I mean, 
you could call it a 4-3-3 at times. I think Odegaard was in a, a double pivot with Thomas Partey. At other times, there was almost a diamond shape with, you know, Saka and Smith-Rowe. Saka coming very narrow. I think he was ostensibly playing from the left, but he was almost in the number 10 slot. And Smith-Rowe pushing out to the right, which allowed Pepe to move on. I, I liked what I saw there. I, I think... Odegaard is really, really technically secure. I think he's a really excellent progressive passer. I think that his physicality is one of the more underrated aspects of his game. And I think that you can see that in terms of his stamina and his pressing. I think he could handle playing in the Premier League. I think if David Silva could survive it, I think Martin Odegaard can. I'm not saying he's the same calibre of player, but I think the traits are similar. Um, that's what I would do because it affords you an extra attacking player, essentially. And it means that you can probably get Nicola Pepe into the team on the right-hand side and you introduce um, a bit of chaos to an Arsenal attack that I sometimes feel lacks that. It's very heavy on structure, heavy on rigidity, but less so on kind of improvisational flair. I think Pepe provides that. And another really interesting point about Odegaard is that We've got a goalkeeper at the moment who's had a lot of praise, um, Brighton game aside, admittedly, for his passing. But when I think back, and I think many of his best passes have been to Martin Odegaard, I think he's got a real... He's something he shares with Granit Xhaka is a bravery to come and receive the ball and to, and to do so almost in any situation. Even when he plays a number 10, he'll willingly drop in to give, be it Ramsdale, be it White be it Gabrielle, an option. And I think against Brighton, yes, we struggled to get the first pass out, but it was the second pass as well where we really, really struggled. And I think Odegaard is someone who would really help us in that regard. So um, that's what I would do. Certainly for these couple of home games we've got coming up, I think we can afford that degree of risk. Tim? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say the reason I think that midfield worked against Burnley um, and so I agree that, like, I, I think it should be a bit horses for courses. But the reason that midfield three worked against Burnley, and I think a lot of us were surprised to see it selected against Burnley, the Smith Rowe Erdegaard party, is because Burnley play a 4 4 2, so they block up your centre backs. So what Arsenal did was just said, OK, block up our centre backs, because what we'll do is we'll go Ramsdale to party. And that was, um, that was the pass that was on all the time. They had Barnes and Wood on Arsenal centre backs, and Arsenal just said, OK amuse yourselves, we'll just pass it to Thomas Party and play out from there. So I, I think in that game, that precise tactic really worked. And, and so that's why I think it has to be horses for courses. Makes sense. Clive? No, I, 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 I agree. Don't shake your head. No, <laughs> You've got to talk about it. It's, it's really, really, you know, really interesting stuff, right? Again, I'll just do a different angle slightly. I mean, I look at players, you know, not just from their football ability, but their personalities they bring to the pitch. And everybody has their personality profile when they go on the pitch. And I think the closest personalities, in a strange way, when it comes to receiving the ball, is Odegaard to, to Shaka. I, I really feel that. I think they have this ability that says, I'm running this game today. Right? That's, that's it. I'm having 100 touches. With Odegaard, I feel the worry we have with him is he must stay connected to the game. The Brighton game went over his head and he was disconnected and he was first sub, I think he was. He must have, for me, if he has the most touches, we're in a good place, right? So we don't need to worry about, again, I keep coming back to it, Gabriel and White, they're midfielders on the ball. So we, can, we have players who can play, but one line up, we've got two players that can also play. That means we're really secure in our box at the back door. So Odegaard, for me, is the closest. And I didn't think I would say that. A, a, a man brought up on Patrick Vieira, that doesn't feel right to me, do you know what I mean? So, but it is right. When it comes down to it, it's about personality, security, and variation of passes. When Odegaard gets it, everybody else is in play. Everyone's in play, because he's got all the tricks, he's got all the clubs. So, for me, get that guy, the base and midfield with Thomas Partey, the two most secure people, and play from there. Mm. That's how I would do it. James, Ben? Yeah, just a very quick thought that maybe hasn't come up yet. I really like the 4-3-3. My only worry, and maybe it's not one you can solve without Xhaka, is that you kind of lose that part of Partey that marauds up the field. And I think that's when he's been at his that's best. Great point, yeah. I really like that side of him. And he will be a fantastic sitting midfielder if you just say, sit in front of the back four, distribute, win the ball. But he's more than that. 
and maybe this is a longer term thing for when Jacker's back and when you look to replace Jacker, you've got to have someone that makes the best out of your best player and for me, Partey's the best player in this and team. And to be fair, if he takes those shots from further back, <laughs> <laughs> maybe by the time they hit the goal. Yeah. To be fair, he scored in the international break, so it's coming. It's definitely coming. Uh, two, yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, do I have time to get one more or should we, should we tie it up? Can we, can we, all right, let's do one more. I'm, the boss says one more. Where is the mic? This guy here has had his hand up for quite a while. Who, 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 who? Yep. You might not be able to see him. But I, ca I can't see anyone. I'm Navy quite, I'm quite sure. Navy blue jumper in the... Yeah, 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 yeah right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just a quick one. Do you think we've cut our losses on Maverick panels too early? Because obviously he's on loan at Stuttgart. They've got an obligation to buy if they stay up, which they're 12th at the moment, so it seems vaguely likely. And it's only like 3 million euros. So he could come back and have been a good backup centre-back, but... That's not an option, potentially. My, my opinion is if Sven Mislintat comes to the club and says, I want to buy X player, you keep X player. Because why would you? I mean, he obviously knows something. He liked the guy. I think he signed him um, originally. I, I None of us know enough about Mavropanos to know how good he can be. He looks like he's adapting well to life in the Bundesliga, but we also see players from the Bundesliga trying to adapt to life here. Sancho! And not particularly thriving, thankfully. Kalasinac. Yeah, that, that's a good example as well. In fact, the whole league seems to struggle coming over here. Um, I think when you have a player with those injury concerns, you know, the best ability is availability. And if we want to talk about Shaka again, because God knows that's a conversation we want to continue oh, to yeah. have, his ability to always be on the pitch, ironically not anymore, is one of the things that made him so valuable. So my opinion would just be, do I think that he will probably wind up looking like a player that we got moved on maybe a little less uh, profitably than we could have? Probably, but the extent to which we can hitch our wagon to a player who hasn't been able to stay available, that can put you into a lot of difficulty that we probably didn't need. And, um, you know, William Saliba is going to come back and be amazing for us, I'm sure. So no problems with the center back position. Does anyone need to talk about Mavropanos? We are, we are, I think, do you, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's not a question, just a comment. Oh, God, I don't want it. I know. You, this was going so well. Oh, shit. You mentioned the award. It's sitting right there. But I just, on behalf of everyone sitting here, I just want to say how incredible it is amongst the competition that you had to win that award for, uh, for best podcast in the Premier League. Could it's you well, read directly from the script, please? It's well-deserved. Yeah. <laughs> it's well-deserved. Well, thank you, Mike, and same to you. The, the folks you've put together... Well, I wasn't fishing. The folks you've put together, even those who are not a regular part of your podcast tonight, this is a panel of all possible panels. So thank, thank you, you on behalf of hopefully everyone here. I mean, if you don't agree with me, you should probably keep <laughs> no, your mouth shut. No, no, I think everyone agrees. For thank, what you've done. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I guess I can wrap up by saying that I have absolutely no right to be here. I have no right to be sitting at this table, to be holding this mic, to have the relationships I have, to have anybody here listening. The fact that this exists is beyond my wildest expectations or imagination. And like I know it can seem saccharine and I know it can seem difficult to, to really understand just in an audio format. So hopefully for those of you who are physically here, please know I couldn't be more grateful. I love my wife and my kids. I love where I am in my life. But as Tim will tell you, but. you need you need something else. You, and and to be at this stage of life and to have this and to have what we've all built in the community that we have, like it is the singular pride and joy of my life besides my wife and kids. So so thank you. Cause like I understand how privileged I am to to sit here and how much of it is owed to Paul and, and Scott and to Clive and to Tim and today to James and James and just the community in general. And that, the, the, you know, I was like, should I bring the award? Like, that's a silly thing. But I was like, no, because it's an award for you guys because so much of it was community voting based and like to, to have the energy to help us win it over podcasts that I think we can safely say have a, have a bigger listener base. It just shows that we've all really connected and to have Maraid here and talk about the Arsenal Foundation, how much we raised, again, the little podcast that could, right? 25,000 pounds, like that, that means something. So I cannot, cannot thank you enough. And that's to everyone physically here and anyone listening from wherever they are, it means the world to me and it has changed my life in a way that I, I don't think I can fully articulate. So thank you. Um, and look, if we win tomorrow when I'm at the at the stadium and everyone feels like I'm the good luck charm and needs me to be at the stadium for every game subsequently, I'm happy to make that sacrifice. Let's say goodbye to James Benj. You can follow him on Twitter at James Benj. Thank you, James.
And thank you to James McNicholas. You can find him on Twitter at Gunnerblog, obviously. Oh, it's still going. Still going. Okay. That's good enough. And, of course, just as important, by the way, but no video to accompany Ms. Tim. You can find him on Twitter at Stoberto. Thank you. Can I, can I just say, before, um, before you wrap up, um, I guess a bit of an announcement. Arsenal women are playing Barcelona women at Emirates Stadium on Thursday, December the 9th go. Um, not only will you see great football, but it's probably the only game in Europe where Arsenal women will really, really need the help of a crowd. Um, tickets are on general sale now. Go. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you to Linus, the gaffer who brought us all together. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to Scott. Thank you to, to Gabriel, who made the audio engineering possible in his team. To Mike from the Gunners Pod for the Gunners versus Cancer charity. And as you know, uh, well, before I get to that, I would just say, please stick around and have a drink, hopefully, or several. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. And we will talk to you and physically see you at the ground after Arsenal 10, Palace Nil.